Welcome, friends, to Economic Update, a weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives and those of our children. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. Today's program is going to touch on military spending, particularly United States spending on the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. We're going to be talking about Chinese production of electric vehicles and how that is shaking literally the whole world. We're going to be exploring briefly how worker co-ops can become even more of a central part of labor union organizing in the years ahead. And finally, in the first half, we'll take a look at some recent remarkable union representation elections at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In the second half, we'll be talking with writer, labor organizer Kim Kelly who's been uh, a remarkable new energetic force in the labor movement here in the United States. Before we begin, as usual, I want to remind you that a volunteer, a fan of our program and an assistant now to the work we do, Charlie Fabian, is ready and willing to take any email communications you have as to segments of this program you might like to see us organize. If you have clippings or information, that's the kind of thing. And I'm going to give you now his email address, charlie.info438 at gmail.com. Charlie, spelled with an I-E, charlie.info438 at gmail.com. So let's jump right in. You, Many of you have asked me about defense spending, military spending, and to talk about it. And so I've decided I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it in separate units so that each point gets carefully made and not lost in trying to do too much in too short a period of time. The United States is currently spending tens of billions of dollars, just counting the last few years. And above all, this money has gone to the war in Ukraine, basically providing mostly military support to the Ukrainian uh, armed forces, and secondarily, an enormous delivery of military equipment again to uh, Israel, which is being used by Israel in its war on Gaza. I want to give you some sense of the dimensions and then the analytics. The United States gave to Israel 66% of its military equipment. In other words, Israel fights its war in Gaza overwhelmingly with United States bombs, guns, planes, ships, you name it. To give you an example, the second biggest supplier of military hardware to Israel is Germany. But Germany gave 30% less than half of what the United States give, and Italy gave a final 5%, and the rest are trivial or zero. So Israel fights its wars with military equipment that it gets from the United States above all, secondarily Germany, and a little bit elsewhere, plus, of course, what it can produce on its own. But it could never fight the kinds of wars it has fought uh, if it relied on its own capability. Israel is, for example, the only country to be scheduled to get F-35 aircraft, which cost millions and millions of dollars each. Congress has not yet approved it, but it is expected that it will. And the goal that Israel has always had has to be militarily way ahead of all the Arab countries as a kind of necessity of its survival. At least that's been the Israeli position. With Ukraine, even more money is involved, since that has a full-fledged war and involves, of course, major countries that are much larger than either Israel or Gaza, for that matter. And so the United States has provided huge amounts, and by far the dominant portion of the military equipment that the uh, Ukrainians use against the Russians. Therefore, the whole world 
sees, and that has to be better understood here in the United States, that these wars, the two major wars that the world is attending to right now, have one thing in common. The military equipment of the United States is central to both of those wars. Russia is central to one. Israel is central to the other one. But it's the United States that is the warring nation of our time. And that needs some thinking. The second thing and the final thing about this for today's discussion is to make sure everyone understands the economics. When the United States decides to deliver tens of billions of dollars to Israel, to Ukraine, here's how it works. The government takes money, mostly our tax money, that we pay in taxes, we who live and work and pay taxes in the United States. The government takes our tax money and pays it out to the American corporations here in the United States who produce the guns, the ships, the bullets, the, the rounds for the howitzers, and so on. That money never leaves. It appears in the newspaper as billions allocated by the Congress to Ukraine. No, 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 careful. What the Ukraine gets are shipment of the guns and ships and tanks and planes and so forth that the American government uses our tax money to buy from American companies. And I can assure you, those American companies are making a huge profit from the prices they charge the American government. So this defense spending is first and foremost a big boon to American companies. Once that's done, those companies don't care if they ship those guns and bullets and drop them in the ocean or ship them off to the moon. They're happy with the profits they've made. It's important that that be understood help you understand why these companies are such enormous boosters of wars that give them their business. China is now producing not only electric cars and trucks, but by far the best quality at the lowest price. And that is producing remarkable results. First of all, Tesla has now been displaced. It was, but is no longer the major seller of electric cars in China. That position has been taken by something you may never have heard of, the BYD Corporation, a Chinese corporation. It is increasingly exporting its electric vehicles elsewhere in the world. Asia, Africa, Latin America, and increasingly now Europe. The one place where BYD's high quality, low price electric vehicles have not come is the United States. And you should all understand why it is not possible for those of you living or working in the United States to buy a Chinese BYD electric vehicle or if you're an American company, to be unable to buy the much better quality, cheaper electric truck for your business, because the United States has slapped a tariff on these goods. Electric vehicles coming into the United States, whatever BYD charges for them, a very low price, that is raised because the United States government collects 27.5% of whatever BYD charges and adds it to the price of a BYD electric vehicle when an American wants to buy it, making the cost of it very high. And you know who loves that? The other producers of electric vehicles, Tesla and the GM Ford and the others that are getting in on the act. Why? Because since they don't have the competition in the United States from the cheaper Chinese BYD, because they are hit 
They're not hit with a tariff the way the Chinese imported vehicle is. They can jack up their prices, which they do, making the entire cost of electric vehicles, to which many are shifting, much higher than it would otherwise be. And why is that important? Because that's inflationary. That's driving up prices in the United States. A company that buys electric trucks passes on the higher price. And why is it higher again? Because we don't allow the Chinese better quality, lower price electric vehicle in. The next time you hear Secretary Treasurer of the Treasury Yellen complaining to the Chinese, gee, you are subsidizing your industries, please remember, so are we here. By putting a tariff, you are helping all the other electric vehicle companies. It's just as if you handed them a check for $20 billion because they can charge a much higher price than they would dare if they actually faced Chinese competition. And the real question, of course, is why are the Chinese able to produce high quality and low price? Here's a hint China has hugely greater robotics in its car factories than we do in the United States. They have put robotics on a scale no other country comes close. That's one of the reasons. Punishing them with a tariff is punishing the efficiency that capitalist competition was supposed to encourage. Here we see it discourages it, and that's not the only error made by conventional economics. What happens if a union decides to organize at a workplace? Well, one of the things that can happen is that the company says, we won't. If you're successful in organizing a union, we'll shut this workplace down. We'll move it to another part of the country or to another part of the world. We'll sell it to another company that can do whatever they want with it. Don't you push us with your unionization. Don't you press us for higher wages because we'll, in the end, tell you this. You push for higher wages, we'll take steps, and you won't have any wages at all. Unions have been held back often by that threat. But here's a suggestion. Suppose the union had, as part of its arsenal, the plan and the operation ready to go to convert the business into a worker co-op. Then they might be able to say to the management, okay, leave, go. Do whatever you want. We're going to convert this business into a worker co-op. We're going to go to all the customers and say, stay with us. We're now the workers. We run this place. We're going to go to the local politicians and say, hey, help us do this. Give us a little financial help. And we'll preserve the jobs that that company was about to move or sell away. You need us. We need you. There's a whole basis for a different strategy here that maybe ought to be pursued. Finally, Harvard University had two union elections recently. Workers in two bargaining units voted. In one, it was the um, Harvard Academic Workers affiliated with the United Auto Workers. 3,100 non-tenured track faculty voted. Here was the vote on the question of joining the union or not. Ready? 1,094 in favor, 81 against. That's the important thing. The support for the union, overwhelming. In the second unit, which was the Harvard Law School Clinic, there was 110 workers. Here's how they voted. 62 in favor of the union, three against it. When you have places like Harvard voting overwhelmingly for unionization, you are seeing something that goes far beyond Harvard or even far beyond higher education. You are seeing a sea change in how people think about the struggle between workers and employers. And let me read to you the statement of one of the union leaders, Jenna Donahue, in the philosophy department, quote, Unions are so important to securing and protecting workers' rights. It's not even just about what benefits they can and do accrue to the workers. 
It's about workers having power in the asymmetrical relationship between the university and those who'd work to make it run. Exactly. Stay with us. We'll be right back with our guest today, Kim Kelly, a writer especially for Teen Vogue magazine. Welcome back, friends, to the second half of today's economic update. I am very pleased and proud to bring before our cameras and our microphones Kim Kelly. I want to introduce you to her and then get right down to the questions that she has graciously agreed to respond to. Kim Kelly is a journalist, author, and third-generation union member in Philadelphia. She is a regular contributor to Team Vogue, In These Times, The Baffler, Rolling Stone, and many more magazines. Her first book is entitled Fight Like Hell, The Untold History of American Labor. It is out now via One Signal, which is an imprint of Simon & Schuster. So first of all, Kim, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. Thanks so much for having me. All right, let's jump in. I want to particularly go after your your role, if I may, as, as a union organizer. Much has been said in recent months, maybe even for a year or two now, that somehow in the last few years, um, in terms of working people's desire for change, in terms of union organizing, union militancy, something is really happening and all of that is getting stronger. I want to ask you, do you agree? Do you disagree? How do you feel about what you're, in a sense, trying to do in the good part of your life? Uh, and given that you're the third generation, it's been in your family for a while. How do you feel about this view that this is going on? I think it's fantastic, and it's absolutely accurate. I mean, you, I'm not uh, as much of a data person. I'm not spending as much time in the Bureau of Labor Statistics tracking all these things. But I spend a lot of time talking to people as a labor journalist. I spend most of my time talking to workers, workers who are organizing, workers on strike, workers who are fed up. And that spirit that people are feeling, that sort of ambient vibe that something has shifted, I think that is very real. And we've really been seeing that grow and build since the beginning of the pandemic, when we had that brief moment where some workers were finally publicly acknowledged and made to feel like, oh, wait, yeah, we, we see you. We value you. Here's a little bit of money. Here's a little bit of, a bit of acknowledgement. And then right afterwards, that was ripped away and they were sent right back to work. I think there's been a shift in the way that people value their time and their labor and their own lives. And that has been playing out across the country for years now. We have seen what happens when you fight and you win. We've seen these big strikes. We've seen these big corporations be pushed to their knees. We've even seen, you know, the political establishment, the president, whatever, showing up at picket lines. Sure, you don't have to hand them anything, but that specific act, that mattered. There has been... It, like a sea change. And the, at least as far as I've been covering labor for the past eight years and people older than me who have been out here for way longer, I think it's undeniable. And I am so excited to be right in the middle of it as a reporter. Do the people that you talk to that give you this impression, do they agree with you? In other words, are you also getting the sense that the people that are in, in movement, as you're now telling us, are they themselves aware of being caught up in something that, to use your words, is a sea change in the the country? I would say so, especially the younger folks, because I think there's been an explosion in coverage of what is happening, of these strikes. There's been a lot more labor reporting. There's been a lot more mainstream reporting about what's happening. And so more folks are seeing that may not have known that before, that it may not have been part of a union family, may not have been exposed to the idea of a union before, realizing, oh, I can do that too. Like someone who works at Starbucks is organizing a union. Someone who works in video games is organizing a union. There are strippers on the West Coast organizing a union. Maybe I can do that at my job. And that is such a profound and just massive shift 
I remember back when I was at Vice, when we organized, I might come from a union family, but I had no idea that there was a union out there for someone like me. And I think it's really that almost psychological shift of of realizing, oh, the labor movement includes me too. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I can get involved and maybe we can actually get something done. So much of the organizing and the strikes and this big push of momentum we've been seeing has come from younger workers, newly organized workers, workers who are fighting for their very first union. And of course, that energy moves on to folks who have been around for a while, to older workers, to workers who are part of more established unions. I think it's contagious. You know, solidarity is the best virus there is. Okay, I want to pick up on your your reminding us about the strippers in Washington. In addition to enjoying that people who probably didn't think of themselves as unionized workers are, in fact, doing what workers do when they want to have a union. What was interesting to me, though, was if I understood correctly, there wasn't a regular union involved, that these working uh, women or men or whoever it was, they undertook it themselves because it would, it would signal to me, and I want your opinion, it would signal to me that this movement really is Yes, it's a union movement, but it's broader. It's bringing in people who who want to build something, whether it's a union or not, and whether a union is helping them or not. There's enough of what you've just described as that sea change of feeling to sustain um, these kinds of organizing efforts, even where there isn't a union, even where there isn't a history of unions playing much of a role yet. Am I reading you right about that? That's exactly right. And one of the things that I think is very important to remember when we're talking about unions, about the union wave, about organizing, is that not every worker can join a union. You know, there are so many workers who are misclassified as independent contractors, workers like folks in prisons who are barred from joining unions. It's not a one size fits all situation. And one of the reasons I thought that the dancers in Washington were led by Madison Zach Wu, who was a dancer herself and became a primary organizer and architect of this campaign, they they thought about it. They thought about, you know, maybe we should try and organize the way that strippers in California and in Portland have done. But they decided that wasn't the right fit for them, that that group of workers decided that their non-employee status was working for them in as much as any job works for anybody. And they decided that going through the state legislature and getting this broader legislation was the approach that worked the best for them and their community. And it's also something that is replicable, which I think is very important to note. The work that Madison and the dancers in Washington State put in and that win that they were able to notch, that is something that dancers in other states can do too. Like a stripper's bill of rights, that is something that is portable. It's not state specific. Some aspects of it were specific to Washington, of course, but the idea is like how here in Philadelphia, uh, not that long ago, we passed a domestic workers bill of rights. And that is something that has reverberated throughout the country. Every win, every victory, every push forward, that that builds on work that other people have done. That is one thing that I really wanted to illuminate in my book, is that no one worker, no one organizer is doing this alone. They're building on centuries of struggle and centuries of lessons and wins and losses and just knowledge. Like None of us are in this alone. And that is one of the most compelling things about the modern labor movement is that there really is a place for everybody, except the cops. <laughs> Let me uh, shift a little bit. A question that has, you know, been part of the labor movement for as long as we've had a labor movement has been a kind of a delicate question. On the one hand, a union or an organization, whether it calls itself a union or not, is trying to get a better deal for the workers, for the working class, from the employer, the employer class. You know, with the famous better wages, better working conditions, and so on. On the other hand, always involved 
whether it's around the corner or below the surface, is another idea, which is why are we, the vast majority, the workers, in a position of having to bargain with a tiny minority of the people involved in every business, the board of directors, the owner, and so why are we having to struggle and fight when we're the majority and in our society, there's at least a presumption that the majority should rule, not that the majority should plead for a chance to make some influence on the... Is there, or let me put it to you this way, how strong are those ideas in this new period of labor militants, labor activity? What's your sense of the idea that maybe what we need is not just a better deal for the working class, but a different economic system that doesn't put the working class at the disadvantages it has to keep struggling to overcome? I think that is very much a part of it, especially among younger workers and more diverse groups of workers who are organizing. And even in some of the more, what we think of as more established uh, seats of labor power. I mean, when you have the president of the UAW talking about how billionaires shouldn't exist and about how we should start planning for a general strike in 2008, that's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big shift away from that, I guess, more conservative idea that has been kind of the status quo for a long time, that we're supposed to work hand in hand with capital, with our oppressors, with, you know, the people in the White House. I think there's been a shift away from that idea because there's no way to really look at the state of things, at the state of just the struggle to survive in this country for the vast majority of us and say, oh, yeah, this is working well. This is something that benefits our members and our workers. This is, let's let it ride. I mean, I think most people know that's BS. <laughs> I don't know. If that's one of the seven words. No, but that's fine. You don't know what that's I mean. fine. <laughs> oh, well, great. But yeah, this is, this is something that I think is very much, if anything, a driving factor among some of the folks who are getting organized. And one of the most, I think, frustrating things for people who are getting involved in the labor movement now, the folks that I talk to, is that their union leadership hasn't necessarily caught up. Not every union and its leadership is super progressive and super militant and super ready to overthrow the existing order. Like I wish they all were, but we only have a handful. But we could have more. I encourage folks all the time to run for office in their unions and get involved and really push the people that are currently in charge towards that idea that something's got to give. We don't need to play nice with the Democrats. We don't need to play nice with the bosses. You know, all of this labor legislation that we have from the 1930s, that some of which is being threatened by the very corporations and oligarchs that, you know, their predecessors inspired it in the beginning, that's all a compromise. You know, now we have the NLRB, we have, you know, OSHA, we have these regulatory agencies. Before we had dynamite, you know, this is the compromise. So perhaps it's time to start reminding those people who are allowed to rule our lives and allowed to rule our pocketbooks that, you know, there's more of us than there are of you. And something's got to give at this point. Maybe, you know, maybe appreciate how nice we've been for the past century or, or so, or get ready for a much bigger fight. Well, I couldn't imagine a better note on which to end. I personally thank you for, for saying that. It's, it's something that I try to say that more and more of us, I think, are trying to say it was a compromise. We can, we should do better. The other side never stops trying to reduce even the compromise we got them to accept. So why aren't we pushing to go in the other direction to add what was a demand all along uh, by millions of people too? Kim Kelly, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Let me urge my audience to get a hold of a book called Fight Like Hell. The title alone makes it interesting. And I hope you'll join us again some point in the future. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. This is great. My pleasure. And thank you. And uh, to all of you in my audience, I hope you found this as interesting as I did. And as always, I look forward to speaking with you again next week.